Happy Halloween, everybody, and welcome back to my channel. Today we're talking about a case that was pretty prevalent in the media a couple of years ago. It happened in 2014. But before we dive into that, let's talk about our sponsor really quickly. I promise it will be really quickly. I won't talk about it for seven minutes again. So sorry. Our sponsor for today is Magellan TV, a new type of documentary streaming service. And I've talked about Magellan TV on my channel before, guys. I love it. When you've run out of things to watch on Hulu and Netflix and Amazon and the History Channel and Investigation Discovery, Magellan TV is going to come in clutch. In fact, it's been my first choice these past couple of months when I'm looking for a really good documentary to watch, whether it's a true crime documentary or history or science, because they have so much. There's over 2,000 documentary TV programs or movies on there, and they're adding more all the time. I love that I can start watching something on my TV and then if I have to go into the laundry room and fold laundry, I can just pick up where I left off on my phone. I love that there's content in 4K that I don't have to pay extra for. I love that there's so much to choose from and so many things I'm interested in watching that I just have a queue lined up of things I want to watch. Today I'm recommending a series called Boogeyman Monsters Among Us and this is actually, it's got 13 episodes and there's episodes on the Jersey Devil, the Sasquatch, Thunderbird, El Chupacabra, the Devil Dog, Honey Swap Monster. It is so interesting. I haven't gotten through all of them yet, but they are so interesting, so cool, and so perfect for the Halloween season. And it really ties in with the case that we're talking about today, which is the Slenderman stabbings. Oh, I just saw that there's another show called Secret Societies. And they have the Heirs of the Knights Templar, the Code of the Illuminati, and the Masks of the Conspirators. Oh, guys, I'm going to be busy. I'm going to be busy. I've got my treadmill material for like the next three months. Okay, so if you're interested in trying out Magellan TV, check out the link in the description box. And if you use my link in the description box, Magellan TV will give you a free month's trial. You can cancel any time after that if you want to, but I don't think that you will. Let's get started on the video. On Friday, May 30th, 2014, 12-year-old Peyton Lutner was picked up to celebrate her friend Morgan Geyser's birthday. They were going to go skating, have some pizza, and then have a sleepover at Morgan's with another classmate, Anissa Wire. Peyton had been looking forward to the party for weeks, and she waved goodbye to her parents, clutching her American Girl doll, excited about having a fun night with friends. But the next morning, Peyton's mother was in the backyard when the doorbell rang. It was a police officer who told her that her daughter had been rushed to the hospital after being stabbed 19 times, and the other two girls were missing. Peyton had told an officer at the hospital that her friend Morgan, a girl she had known and been close to since they'd been in kindergarten, had been the one who attacked her, and they hadn't been alone. Anissa had been present as well. How had an average, typical sleepover turned into a brutal attack on a sixth grade girl by two of her classmates? What could their motive possibly have been? Well, the short answer is Slenderman. Slenderman is a fictional character depicted as thin, tall, and alien-like with a featureless head and face, usually wearing a black suit. He first made his appearance in June of 2009 on a creepy pasta internet forum called Something Awful. It was in a thread hosting a Photoshop contest. The challenge was to create a paranormal image and someone with the username Victor Surge, whose real name was Eric Knutson, he posted two black and white photos of groups of children standing with the Slenderman. To these pictures, he added bits of text such as, we didn't want to go, we didn't want to kill them, but its persistent silence and outstretched arms horrified and comforted us at the same time. Dated 1983, photographer unknown, presumed dead. Another paragraph accompanying the photos said, one of two recovered photographs from the Sterling Library blaze, notable for being taken on the day when 14 children vanished and for what is referred to as the Slenderman. Dated 1986, photographer Mary Thomas, missing since June 13th, 1986. So for those of you who don't know, a creepy pasta is essentially something that gets copied and pasted across the internet. And it gets copied and pasted and everybody adds their own creative flair to it until it takes on a life of its own. And of course, creepy pastas center around legends or stories of something scary. 
And the idea of Slender Man started out as something fictional, a Photoshop contest, but the creepypasta community had their own little inside joke. They would take all of these made up characters and stories, but present them as if they were real things, as if they were real life. The No Sleep subreddit requested that all users maintain that front in the interest of having creepy fun. The users would post original horror stories to the subreddit as if they were retelling something that actually happened to them, and the Redditors who responded would respond as if they believed that it's true. So Slenderman spread on the internet to be incorporated in other creepy stories, and he became an urban legend, an urban legend that terrified and intrigued young children who believed that everything they read on the internet was true. Nudson had created Slenderman to make something whose motivations can barely be comprehended, which would cause unease and terror in the general public. He was inspired by authors such as Stephen King and H.P. Lovecraft. Yahoo Answers gave a more clear picture of what Slenderman was, stating, the Slender Man is a supernatural creature that is described as appearing as a normal human being but he is described as being eight feet tall, and he has vectors or extra appendages that are described to be as sharp as swords. The creature is known to stalk humans and cause many disappearances. He is described as a shadow creature that has a missing face. The creature fits into many mythologies from different nations, which brings up the possibility that he could be real. Slender Man does not do his own dirty work. Instead, he convinces others to kill his victims for him. If they do, they will win a special place with him. He haunts fields, forests, abandoned buildings, and draws children away from their families. He is the boogeyman for the internet era. He is the thing hiding under your bed or looking at you from your closet after your parents put you to sleep and turn out the lights. Slender Man is what your parents warn you about when you go out and ride your bike alone and they tell you not to talk to strangers. The thing with Slender Man is as his popularity grew, he began to be incorporated into popular mainstream media such as video games, movies. On the popular game Minecraft, there are tall characters called Endermen. Due to their long skinny bodies and similar name, they have drawn comparisons to the Slender Man. There have been entire games based on the Slender Man character, Slender the Arrival and Slender the Eight Pages. Slender the Eight Pages, released in 2012, was downloaded two million times within its first month. There are movies about Slender Man. You have 2018's Slender Man. You have 2016's Beware the Slender Man. You have 2015's Always Watching. And I mean, you literally had people taking to YouTube, making these realistic videos, realistic, I guess, if you're a kid watching them, where they would see Slender Man and they would capture him on camera. Do you guys believe in Slenderman. Slenderman has been going around the internet for the longest time. Probably like five plus years now. I think a little bit more than that actually. And no one really knows if Slenderman is real. What is it? What is it? <laughs> what do you see? Slenderman. No, not for real Slenderman. What is it? Where? <laughs> or they would get adults to sit in front of the camera and talk about their experiences with Slender Man. So when you're a kid and you're watching these things on YouTube and you see somebody who's capturing things on camera that looks real to you, you begin to believe it. What is it? What is it? <laughs> what do you see? No, not for real Slender Man. What is it? Where? Tío, 
and I have an eight-year-old who watches YouTube and I have to constantly explain to him that these things aren't real, that they're just for entertainment, that people can use special effects to make things look more realistic. I literally had to explain to him that there was no way this YouTuber was FaceTiming Jesus a couple of weeks ago. I had to have that conversation with him. So kids are really impressionable. They believe what they see on YouTube or what they read on the internet is real. If there's an adult telling them it's real or if there's a video with enough special effects or enough makeup or enough costumes to make it look legit. I'm sure that I never thought when I was, you know, planning on having kids that one day I'd have to have a discussion with my son that nobody can FaceTime Jesus. I never thought that was that was going to be a thing I'd have to do, but hey, this is the world we live in. With Slenderman's image and name being used in all of these movies and video games, he became sort of a celebrity to the young kids who were reading about him online. Young kids who didn't have the presence of mind to understand that what an entire community was telling them was true was actually a hoax, an invented figure collectively fleshed out by users on the internet who ran with the story and added more details as the years went on. I had to have my own talk with Aiden about Slender Man and explain to him that it wasn't real, that it was just made up, and it was just a fun thing that people were doing on the internet because kids don't have the presence of mind to tell the difference. They don't have that logical, critical thinking yet to question what they're told, especially if it's by somebody that's an adult or somebody who's a YouTuber and has a big following. They're gonna think that this person being a grown up or being somebody that a lot of other people listen to gives them legitimacy. They have authority to young children. They're somebody important. They're somebody other people look up to. So they believe it without questioning it. So what happened with Peyton, Morgan, and Anissa? As always, to understand what happened at the end, we have to go back to the beginning. Morgan and Peyton had met in the sixth grade and they'd remained friends up until about the sixth grade when Peyton started to pull away from Morgan a little bit. Morgan had met another girl new to their school who had just moved into the same apartment complex that she lived in. They rode the bus to and from school together every day, and this new friend, whose name was Anissa Wire, she introduced Morgan to the creepy pasta wiki and Slenderman. Peyton claimed that Morgan was obsessed with the tall, faceless man after that, and she would email Peyton links. These links led to websites and videos that talked about things the Slenderman had done, as well as made efforts to prove that he was real. Morgan also told Peyton that Peyton was being stalked by Slenderman and he would look into her windows at night when she was sleeping. Peyton became so terrified by this that she would pull her curtains every night, close the door to her closet, and sleep facing away from the window. At one point, she even confided in her mother, telling her mother the things that Morgan was saying and telling her mother that she was scared. Peyton's mother did some research online and told her daughter that there was nothing she could find during her research to prove that the story was anything more than a fabrication, that Morgan was probably just trying to scare her and she shouldn't worry too much. Even with her mother's assurances, Peyton couldn't be sure. Anissa and Morgan seemed so certain that Slenderman was real and they even claimed that they could see him when nobody else could. So as Morgan and Anissa grew closer, Peyton drifted away. She said that the girls weren't very nice to her when they were all together, especially Anissa. She would say really mean things. She would call Peyton names and she even physically assaulted her a couple of times. Anissa would claim she was being so mean to Peyton because she was hungry or tired. And later, if Anissa and Peyton were ever alone, Anissa would apologize for what she'd done. Peyton came to realize that Anissa was only mean to her when Morgan was around, almost as if she was trying to show off. Anissa Wire had recently come to the middle school from a different elementary school than Peyton and Morgan had attended. Her parents had just gotten divorced. The few friends her parents had just gotten divorced. The few friends she'd had at her old school went to a different middle school, and she had trouble connecting with her new classmates. Her teachers described her as very intelligent, a stickler for the rules. She wasn't a kid who enjoyed working together with others, and whenever the teacher announced that they were going to be doing group or partner work, Anissa would busy herself with something else, like sharpening her pencil or shuffling through her papers, 
hoping that she could buy herself enough time to avoid picking a partner. I remember being in school and the teacher announcing that we would have to pick a group or a friend to work with and I did the exact same thing. I would literally do anything to buy time. I have to go to the bathroom, I'm not feeling good, I have to go to the nurse. I would literally go up to the pencil sharpener and sharpen my pencil for 15 minutes hoping that by the time I was done, the group thing would be over because I hated, hated working in, in groups during school. So I completely get this. When Anissa first came to her new school, she spent the first few months eating her lunch alone and sitting alone on the bus to and from school. She didn't make friends easily and her fellow students thought she was a bit odd and kept their distance, even sometimes being cruel to her to the point that the teacher had to sit them all down and remind them not to bully other kids. But one afternoon, as Anissa sat on the school bus to go home, Morgan sat next to her and they were inseparable from that moment. Morgan Geyser was also a bit of an outsider, but by choice, the other kids thought she was weird. Anissa's father remembered the first time he saw her at the school bus, she was walking to the bus stop wearing a Vulcan mask and it wasn't Halloween. Her teachers said she was very smart, did her homework and followed the rules, but one teacher claimed she had an attitude of screw all of you to get attention. She had run into some disciplinary issues. It was reported that one day she ran around the playground barking like a dog and chasing her classmates. Another time she was suspended for bringing a rubber mallet into school. Another student saw it in her locker and reported her. Her homeroom teacher said Morgan seemed four years older than she really was. She was incredibly intelligent and astute. Morgan's mother described her as a sweet girl growing up, but she could tell from an early age that Morgan didn't react to things as most kids her age would have. She didn't seem to have empathy for others. They watched Bambi together when Morgan was young, and her mother was worried that she would be upset by the scene where Bambi's mother died. When the scene came on, Morgan watched impassively, and the only reaction she gave was when she yelled at Bambi on the television screen to run away and save himself. So I definitely don't feel like that's normal as a small child to be watching Bambi and that whole scene where Bambi and, and his mother are running away from the hunters, obviously that upset all children. And that's why Morgan's mother was concerned that she would be upset about it when she first watched it. And, and I think most of our reaction was to be sad that Bambi's mother had died and he was now alone in the world. That's probably a normal reaction, especially as a child, because you depend so much on your mother that seeing Bambi lose his mother would really be upsetting and almost traumatizing to a lot of children. But not to Morgan. Morgan told Bambi to run and save himself. So Morgan and Anissa, they shared a feeling of loneliness, a feeling of isolation that made them feel incapable of connecting with others their own age. And then they began to share this interest in creepypastas and Slenderman. More importantly, they shared a belief that Slenderman was real. And he lived in a mansion with all the other creepypastas in a place called Nicolay State Park in Wisconsin. This was a five hour drive from where Morgan, Anissa, and Peyton lived in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Morgan and Anissa also believed that if they could prove their loyalty to the Slender Man, that he would make them his proxies and they could go live with him in this mansion. And this was how the plan developed, to kill Peyton Lutner, because this was the only way that you could prove you were worthy to Slender Man, that you were loyal to him by killing somebody. Anissa and Morgan began formulating their plan months before they attempted it. Morgan told Anissa that her parents let her have two friends sleep over every year for her birthday, and this would be the perfect time to do it. Anissa and Morgan exchanged multiple emails. They corresponded with each other all day long. They sent each other links to Slenderman-related content, and they even came up with a code that they could use in the emails so nobody would know what they were talking about. They had nicknames for each other. Morgan called Anissa Scorpion because apparently she was aggressive at times. And Anissa called Morgan Kitty because she had four cats and apparently she sometimes acted like a cat. The series of events that happened on May 29th and May 30th of 2014 are pieced together using the accounts of Morgan, Anissa, and Peyton. On Friday after school, Morgan and Anissa went to Anissa's house to pack a bag. 
The bag contained a change of clothing, granola bars, bottles of water, the necessities for the long journey they knew they would be taking to Nicolette National Park after they killed their friend. After this, Morgan, Anissa, and Morgan's dad went to pick up Peyton from her house, and then they went to Skate World. On Friday, Skate World had a free pizza special, so the girls skated and ate pizza and acted like regular 12-year-olds, having fun together, being goofy, and taking pictures. After this, they went back to Morgan's and they played in the basement for a little while. According to Peyton, they were all playing on tablets and Morgan was playing The Sims. At one point, she let the other two girls know that she planned on locking her Sims family in their house, starving them, and then setting their house on fire. But Morgan often said weird, morbid things like this, especially since her obsession with the creepy pastas, so Peyton didn't think too much of it. Morgan and Anissa had many different plans of how they were going to kill Peyton. Their original plan was that they were going to do it at night when she was asleep. Anissa had said that it was easier to kill someone if they were sleeping or knocked out because if they were awake, you'd have to look into their eyes and you'd see yourself in their eyes and nobody wants to kill themselves. They were going to wait until she fell asleep, then they were going to stab her, and then they were going to cover her with blankets so nobody would notice, grab their packed bag, and head out to Slenderman's mansion. She would be discovered the next morning, but by that time, they'd be long gone. Now, that was the plan initially, but at the very last minute, Morgan changed her mind and said she'd like to give Peyton at least one more morning. That's really big of you, Morgan. Really big of you. So they planned to do it the next day instead. On Saturday morning, Morgan and Anissa woke up before Peyton. They went downstairs and started doing some online quizzes together. When Peyton woke up, she joined them and she was taken aback when Anissa asked her, what would you do if someone just walked up to you and started stabbing you? Once again, Morgan and Anissa were into these dark, creepy things. Peyton had no idea that this question was foreshadowing for what was to come. Morgan's mother woke up and they all had breakfast, strawberries, and donuts. Then the girls asked if they could walk to the park to play. And Morgan's mother didn't typically like Morgan to walk to the park alone, but because all the girls were together, she didn't see why not, and so she said yes. As the three girls walked to the park, Peyton walked a little bit ahead of Morgan and Anissa. Morgan opened her coat to show Anissa the knife, a five-inch kitchen knife she'd taken from her house before they'd left. Anissa claims she thought to herself at this point, wow, this is really happening. When they arrived at the park, they played on the playground for a bit before Morgan told Peyton that she wanted to show her some graffiti in a bathroom stall and guided her towards the park's bathroom. Once in the bathroom, Anissa and Morgan had Peyton go into a bathroom stall. This was plan B now. They were going to kill her in the bathroom because there was a drain in the floor for the blood to go down. And once again, they figured it would be easier if Peyton would just go to sleep. So Anissa told Peyton to sit on the floor and go to sleep. Peyton did sit on the floor with her back to the wall, but she said she didn't want to go to sleep. At this point, Morgan has the knife, so they are both in this stall with Peyton, Anissa and Morgan. And Morgan locks the door and faces Peyton, but she, she can't do it. So she grabs Anissa and they go into the stall next door. And Morgan tells Anissa, you know, I just can't do it. I'm too squeamish. You have to do it. Anissa claims at this point, you know, she wasn't very nervous about killing somebody. What she was most nervous about was seeing a dead body because the last dead body she'd seen had been at her uncle's funeral. So Anissa doesn't want to kill Peyton either. Anissa tells Morgan that she has to do it. And once Morgan is faced with the realization that Anissa's not going to do it, it has to be her if it's going to happen, she starts crying. She has some second thoughts. She told Anissa, I can't do this. I'm too scared. You have to. So second thoughts about being the one to kill Peyton, not second thoughts about killing Peyton. She didn't say, we can't do this. She didn't say, Peyton is my friend. This is wrong. She said, I can't do this. Personally, I can't, but I'm okay with it if you want to go ahead and do it. Anissa says when Morgan started to lose it, she had to put her arms around Morgan and calm her down. And then she started petting Morgan like she was a cat. They both went back into the bathroom stall where Peyton's probably sitting there like, what is going on with these kids? I can only imagine what this poor girl is thinking at this point. And Morgan still has the knife. But once again, she couldn't go through with it. And they were telling Peyton to go to sleep, go to sleep, but she wouldn't. So Anissa hit her in the face hard, causing Peyton's head, the back of her head, to hit the back of the bathroom stall. Anissa was trying to knock her unconscious so that it would be easier to kill her. 
Once this didn't work and now both Peyton and Morgan are upset, they decided to leave the bathroom and take a walk. Anissa and Morgan switched to plan C. They were going to lure Peyton into the woods that were near the park and kill her there. So Morgan told Peyton that they were gonna go bird watching and play a game of hide and seek. During Morgan's police interview, once she got caught, she's asked, why'd you guys go into the woods? And she responded, because we knew what we had to do. We lied to her and tricked her. When the detective follows this up with the question, well, how did you get her to follow you into the woods? Morgan replies, we said we were going to go bird watching. People who trust you become very gullible. And it was sort of sad. Morgan was going to be the seeker first, so Anissa and Peyton hid, and Anissa ran with Peyton, pulling her deeper and deeper into the woods. When Anissa was asked about this moment in her police interview, she said, She was going to hide one place, I was going to hide another, and then Morgan and I were going to be like lionesses chasing down a zebra. When Morgan found them and it was time to do it, she again pulled Anissa aside and said, I can't do this. You know where all the soft spots are. And she handed Anissa the knife. Anissa once again handed the knife back to Morgan and said, it has to be you. And Morgan responded, I'm not going to do it until you tell me to. Anissa didn't respond right away. Instead, she began walking away from Morgan and Peyton. And once she walked about five feet, she stopped, turned, looked at Morgan and said, now, go ballistic, go crazy. And then she turned her back on the other two girls so she wouldn't have to watch what was happening. Morgan, holding her knife, crept slowly towards Peyton as if she were a spooked horse. Peyton, who was still standing up watching all of this go down, probably was feeling a little afraid at this point, but still hadn't processed the fact that these two girls were going to hurt her. Morgan got closer and closer to Peyton and said, don't be scared, I'm just a little kitty. And then she pounced on Peyton, knocking them both to the ground. Morgan sat on Peyton's leg, got close to the ear of her childhood friend, and whispered, I'm sorry, before proceeding to stab her 19 times. When Morgan was asked about this moment in her police interview, how it felt when she was stabbing her friend, Morgan responded, it didn't feel like anything, it felt like air. And then she mimicked stabbing motions with her hands before saying to the police officer, you know what happened, don't you? It didn't feel like anything, it was like air. So she put the leaf in her hand or what'd you do? I just continued to, you know what happened, didn't you? Okay, so Morgan has stabbed Peyton both Morgan and Anissa now need to get to Slenderman's mansion, but before they do, they have to make sure that Peyton's not going to survive, that she can't go and get help. Peyton manages to stand up after being stabbed 19 times and try to walk towards the road. Anissa took her by her shoulders and steered her away from the road. She told her to just lay down and be quiet because she would lose less blood that way. Anissa told Peyton they were going to go get help, but they had no intention on going to get help. Morgan recalled that the last thing Peyton said to her as they were leaving her to die was, I trusted you, I hate you. And then she just whispered over and over again that she couldn't see and she couldn't breathe. Anissa and Morgan walked away from her at an angle so that she wouldn't see them leaving. And they started out on their journey to Slenderman's mansion. Anissa and Morgan would walk a long way, but they wouldn't make it to Nicolette National Park. And this story, although sad and twisted, it does not end with the death of Peyton Lutner. Because most of us don't know what we're truly capable of until we're put in a position where we don't have any other choice but to be strong. And who would think that a 12-year-old girl riddled with stab wounds could find the strength to crawl towards the road to get help? She was struggling to breathe, her vision was going dark, but she fought so hard for her own life that she was able to get to that road and she found help in a passing cyclist. So many unlikely things had to happen that day in order for Peyton to survive this attack. Luckily, the cyclist, Greg Steinberg, chose to ignore a sign saying that a bike path was closed and he rode down it anyway. Peyton would have had to have crawled close enough to the road to be seen by someone. Luckily, both of these things did happen and Greg saw Peyton laying on the side of the road and he called the police. Okay, so I am going to play a 911 call now. 
A lot of people were upset during the Brittany Murphy video that I played the 911 call and they wanted a heads up if I was gonna play the 911 call. So there will be a timestamp in the description box if you wanna know when that ends and skip right to that place. But personally, I don't think it's too upsetting of a 911 call and it gives some context to what we're talking about. I think all the 911 calls that I play in these videos are important and relevant to the case we're talking about or else I wouldn't play them. I don't do anything for gratuitous reasons. I don't do anything for shock value. I just like facts and evidence and since a 911 call is part of a case's facts and evidence, that is why I play them. But if you want to skip over it, like I said, it's not too upsetting. If you want to skip over it, there's a timestamp in the description box. So let's play the 911 call now. One, one. What's the address of your emergency? Walks to County Lane and transfer over a caller on Big Bend at the dead end just south of Rivera. Okay. Came upon a 12 year old female. She appears to be stabbed. She appears to be what? Stabbed. Stabbed? Correct. Okay. Sir, you still there? Yes. Hi, sir. So is are you with this 12 year old female? Yeah, she says she's having trouble breathing. She said she was stabbed multiple times. Stabbed multiple times? <laughs> yeah. Okay, sir, are you with her right now? Yes. Is she awake? She's awake. Is she um, breathing? Yeah, she's breathing. She said she can take shallow breath. She's alert. Okay, stay with her. We're sending the police department. Don't hang up, okay? okay. Hold on we'll just a up. minute. Don't hang up. Okay. Okay. Hold on just a minute, sir. We're sending officers. Okay. Is there any assailant around? Ah, uh, I didn't even look. I don't see anybody. Okay, stay stay right with her, sir. Is she on the ground or is she standing up? No, she's laying on the grass. Laying on the grass. Stay right with her. Just let me know if she is remaining conscious or not, okay? Okay. Is there any bleeding going on? Her clothing has got blood on it. Where are the wounds? Do you see where the wounds are? No, I'm, I don't know if I should be rolling her over and checking or not. Do you know where? Okay, just stay with her and just let me know if she's conscious or alert or stops breathing or anything. Hold on, I'm going to talk to the ambulance. Police are also en route. Okay, thank you. I'm bothering you at all? My shade? Okay. Keep her very strong. Two copies. Okay. Just keep her in that position. Just let me know on her breathing. Okay. Okay, were you just passing through? Yes. Okay, and you found her and she was just laying there? Yes. Okay. Okay, so you see any active bleeding or blood spurting out or anything like that? No, unless it's underneath or I just see okay. just dried blood. Okay, just dried blood. Okay. Okay, is she still breathing? Is she still alert? Yeah. Okay, stay with her. Yep. Stay I, with her. I, Keep an eye on her. Hold on just a minute. Do not hang up, sir. Okay, I will not. And she didn't say who did this or how well, it happened? I don't, know if, I don't know if she wants to be talking. I started to ask okay. her. And then That's okay. If she's... She's trying to save her energy, I think. Okay, but you see nobody else around you. Are you clearly visible when they pull down that road towards the dead end that they'll see you? I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't are, hear you. Are you clearly visible when they come down there so they see you? I'm going to have, i got a gold flashlight on my bicycle. I'll shine that towards any emergency vehicle I see. And I'll be, I'll be standing in the middle of the road. You're in the middle of the road? And where is she, in the side of the road? Yeah, she's on a grass. It's a okay. little, a okay. little trail I take on my bicycle. Okay, okay, see. So don't hang up, sir. Just stay right with me. Okay. And let me know immediately if you see anything else suspicious in the area, a car, a person, anything. All right. Keep your eyes open. Was there anyone coming or leaving, or any cars coming or leaving when you came upon her? Um, no. Nothing? No. So were you on foot walking by, or did you pull up in a car? Bicycle. You are on a bicycle? Yeah. How did you see her? Did you just... She's right in the middle of the little path I take. Middle of the little path. Okay. Yeah. There's a squad car coming now. Okay. The squad car coming? Okay. Flag yeah. the squad car down. Protect her. Here he's coming. Does she have a bike or anything with her? No, I don't see it. One sandal is off, but, you know, maybe three feet away from her. Okay. Flag that officer down. I'm going to let you here. go. Okay. Greg stayed with her until the paramedics arrived, trying to apply pressure to her wounds and tell her that everything was going to be okay. She was rushed to the hospital. She had to go into surgery right away, but before she did, she was able to answer questions for the police by writing down her answers. And at that time, she indicated that the ones who had done this to her were her friends, two other 12-year-old girls. 
After she went into the operating room, the doctors came out and told the police that she'd been one millimeter away from death. The 19 stab wounds had punctured her liver, her pancreas, her stomach, and heart, and the one that penetrated the heart missed the major artery by one millimeter. If that had been punctured or even grazed, her chances would have been slim to none. And that's what I'm talking about. So many things had to happen in order for Peyton to walk away from what happened to her, but Peyton did survive. And now they had to find Morgan and Anissa. As the girls walked away from their dying friend, Morgan wiped the blood on the knife off on her jacket and put the knife into a purse that she'd brought that used to belong to her mother. She told the detectives later that it was weird. She didn't feel any remorse. It just seemed necessary. And she says this often when asked why she did this. It was necessary. And when they found the girls, they found this purse sitting between them and nestled between granola bars and bottles of water was the murder weapon or the attempted murder weapon. Anissa was wearing a blue sweatshirt with dark stains on it and Morgan was wearing a plaid coat which had blood stains on it from where she'd wiped the knife off on her coat. They were brought into custody at 2.24 p.m. and one of the first police officers on the scene asked Anissa and Morgan what happened. Anissa responded that she couldn't tell him because he would think she was crazy. And he told her, I don't think anybody's crazy. And she responded to him, some people were going to kill my family unless I did something bad. Both girls were brought to the police station to be interviewed. The officers took DNA swaps and took the clothing that they were wearing as evidence. Then Morgan and Anissa were separated and questioned by two different detectives. Detective Michelle Trusani interviewed Anissa. And watching the recorded interview, it reminds you of how young these girls actually were. As soon as Anissa is in the room with the detective, she asks Detective Trusoni if she knows how far they walked because actually she's not that athletic and she's curious. She's wearing two different socks, which is such a 12-year-old thing to do, and she has these bracelets on that she tells Detective Trusoni about, stating, I made this one, and my friend Kelly gave me this one. Detective Trusoni reads Anissa her Miranda rights, and Anissa needs her to explain exactly what Miranda rights are. She's just this little girl with mismatched socks and friendship bracelets, but we know that she just took part in this very horrible thing, and the dichotomy is startling and, frankly, very sad. The detective has to leave the room for a moment, so she tells Anissa, you know, I gotta go, but do you want any water or anything? And Anissa immediately jumps up and volunteers some information about her friend Morgan. She said, quote, she can be a little jumpy and forget what she's saying in the middle of a sentence a lot. She says she hears voices. I just wanted to tell you. So is this a girl trying to protect her friend by letting the detectives know how to handle her? Or is this an extremely intelligent preteen trying to set the stage for a mental insanity defense? When they finally settle in and start talking, Anissa explains to Detective Trasoni what was behind the stabbing. She says, quote, So there's this website called the Creepypasta Wiki. It's full of horror stories that are meant to purposely scare you through online literature and stuff like that. One of them is called Slenderman. He has these proxies, or servants as people call them. And Morgan said, hey Anissa, we should be proxies. And I said, okay, how do we do that? She claimed Morgan told her, we have to kill Bella. And that was how they would prove themselves worthy to the Slenderman. By the way, Bella is Peyton's middle name, and it's what her friends and people who knew her often called her. Because in kindergarten, there had been two Peytons in her class, so Bella just told everyone, call me Bella, it's my middle name, so that they could not get the two of them mixed up. So often, if you watch the girls' police interview, and I'll link things in the description box so you can check it out if you want, you'll hear Morgan and Anissa refer to her as Bella. And watching this police interview with Anissa and Detective Trusoni, it's like watching worlds collide. A child trying to explain creepypastas to an adult. Adults, for the most part, have no idea what creepypastas are or who Slender Man is, so a good part of this interview was Anissa getting frustrated at times with Detective Trusoni because the detective was trying to understand and she'd say things like, oh, so it's like this, and Anissa would be like, no. No, and get frustrated because she's trying to explain something to this detective that this detective has never encountered before. And there's one of them called Slenderman. It's like really Slenderman? Slender? Slenderman. Oh, Slenderman. Like skinny guy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And a proxy again. What is a proxy? It's like um, a servant or like uh, an apprentice. 
Okay, and they're uh, uh, a servant of who? The, um, whichever, um, I, they kind of don't have a choice. Slender's like the really big, um, he's a like head of it all, supposedly. Okay, so Slender's the big guy. Yeah. The top guy. And the proxies um, are his puppets. Yes, that's how people put up puppets. Oh, okay. Boy, I never even heard this before. Okay. Anissa is finally able to tell Detective Trussoni that Morgan came up with this plan to kill Peyton at the end of 2013, probably late December of 2013. She tells Detective Trussoni that the proxies don't really have a choice because Slenderman is really big. He's like the head of the creepypastas. She says, quote, there are killers and proxies. Proxies are apprentices to the killers, and the killers are either by themselves or they have proxies. And the killers have the proxies do it for them? Uh, no. Okay. It's either killers or proxies? Well, some, yeah. Uh, okay. I don't know that much about <laughs> proxies and all that. Okay. I just know what the internet has told me. Okay. So the internet has told you that Slender the Slender. Is there just one? Yes. Or, okay. So Slender has a bunch of proxies, mm -hmm. a bunch of puppets. Yes. And amongst these puppets, there are also killers? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So proxies or puppets and killers are not the same? Yes. Okay. Like on a, um, like a triangle chart, Slender would be up here. Okay. Then be like killers and then proxies. Okay, so killers outrank the proxies. Yeah. She's trying to explain the leadership structure of the creepypastas to this detective. And she uses a triangle at one point to illustrate this. She says a slender man is at the top, the killers are underneath him, and the proxies make up the base of this triangle. Basically like a huge supernatural pyramid scheme. Because I'm not sure what the proxies really get out of this whole arrangement. Anissa says, quote, I was surprised, but kind of excited. I wanted proof that he existed because there are skeptics out there saying that he didn't exist. There's a bunch of forums online and sources online saying that they did see him. Anissa said at first she didn't want to do it, but she didn't want to leave Morgan out there by herself. Because with all of these creepy pastas walking around in plain sight, it can get kind of dangerous. Here is part of the case that I often feel gets overlooked when this story gets retold. So Anissa tells Detective Trussoni about another creepy pasta called Jeff the Killer. In their extensive online research, Anissa and Morgan had discovered that Jeff the Killer was a real person named Jeffrey Woods who killed his whole family. She says, quote, so we were like, okay, so we know at least Jeff is real, so we got our hopes up and thought that everyone else was real. The fact that Anissa and Morgan would have gotten their hopes up about these creepy pastas being real is incredibly disturbing to me. Because these online creations, they're essentially what nightmares are made up of. The scariest things that the human imagination could come up with goes into creating these creepypastas. They're dangerous, they kill people, but they also have this supernatural aura to them as well, which makes them even more scary and more dangerous. Because there's no escaping Slenderman or Jeff the Killer once they have set their sights on you, and it is said that once you become aware of Slenderman, he becomes aware of you. And once he's aware of you, it's pretty much over. He can read your thoughts. He can teleport to be behind you in a moment. He has these appendages that come off his back that can stab you. He has no face and he wears a black suit all the time. You would think that these kids, these young girls, they're 12, they'd be hoping against hope that these creepy pastas were not real. But Anissa and Morgan were hoping that they did exist. They got their hopes up that Slenderman was real because Jeff the Killer was allegedly real. And the whole Jeff the Killer being real thing, it gives you an idea of how readily these young people believe what they read on the internet. And how they're not digging deeper to check their sources to prove or disprove what they're seeing or what they're reading. Jeff the Killer is not a real person. He never was. And when I googled it, I did find a lot of sources saying that he was real and a lot of these sources looked legitimate. They were giving backstories, there was personal accounts, eyewitnesses, other names he might have gone by, where he might have lived, but it really only took me 10 additional minutes 
of looking around to figure out that once again, it was just this big elaborate hoax. Everybody on the internet who knew about the hoax got together and said, let's keep convincing people that Jeff the killer is real. Let's keep convincing people that Slenderman is real. It'll be fun, they said. I guess it wasn't fun for Peyton. I mean, I found newspaper stories and newspaper clips online saying Jeff the killer was real and his name was Jeffrey Woods and he killed his whole family and this whole backstory, but it's not true. But we can't really expect kids once they see these legitimate sources to, to do further research, I suppose. So I just hope if any of you are parents here, you let your kids know that they should definitely do a little bit more research when checking into these things online and reading about these things online because there are entire communities out there who want to convince children that these horrifying creatures exist. And I mean, as fun as that kind of stuff can be when you're older and you have a firm grasp on reality, I like reading creepypastas. I like scaring myself. It's enjoyable. It's fun when you're older and you understand what's real and what isn't. But when you're 12 and you don't have the presence of mind or the knowledge to dig deeper and actually find out the true story, it can become a part of your reality. When Anissa is asked, do you think Morgan is completely to blame? Anissa responds, no. I don't think any of this would have happened if I hadn't told her about the creepy pastas. Morgan was interviewed by Detective Thomas Casey, and let me just tell you, I, I, I was creeped out by Morgan's interview with Detective Casey. At first, I thought I was watching one of those paranormal shows, like um, where there's a hidden camera in the corner and then you see somebody just get like yanked out of their bed by a poltergeist. It could not have been more creepy if it had been scripted. She speaks in this even, emotionless, and sometimes very articulate way, almost as if there's an adult in her body using a kid voice. She tells Detective Casey, quote, I'm here because we were careless. I knew that this would happen. I knew we'd get into trouble. When she's asked what they were trying to do, Morgan responds, kill her. I might as well just say it. We were trying to kill her. When Detective Casey asks Morgan why she invited Peyton over to the sleepover, why did she choose that time to do it, she responds very matter-of-factly, because we would all be together. It was a flawless plan, actually. <laughs> and where Anissa almost seems to be aligning herself with Morgan during her police interview, Morgan completely throws Anissa right under the bus at every opportunity that she can. She tells Detective Casey that they both stabbed Peyton and she believes that Anissa was the one who stabbed first. Then she put the knife into Morgan's hand and told her to do it. Morgan also told Detective Casey that they lied to Peyton and told her that they were going to get help. She says, quote, I didn't have anything to do with the lying though. That was all Anissa. She said we would go get help as if the lying thing is the issue here. I stabbed her, but I didn't lie to her, okay? I have standards. And she speaks in such a childlike, innocent way, but with a flat affect. When she's asked if she's sure that Anissa stabbed Peyton, she responds, yeah, not really, it's sort of confusing. I've been trying to black out her screams all day, referring to Peyton's screams as she was being stabbed by Morgan but she says it almost as if the memory of the screams is annoying to her instead of upsetting to her, like a fly that's buzzing around her ear and won't go away. And in general, Morgan does not appear to be upset at all. Whereas Anissa was clearly shaken and at times crying, Morgan shows not one bit of emotion or feeling. And at the times when Detective Casey isn't in the room, Morgan occupies herself by singing out loud, Jodi Arias style. Then we stabbed her. Who, had, who stabbed her first? I think um, Anissa stabbed her first and then I continued and then like, she was like, Morgan, make sure she doesn't escape! And then it was like, uh... So you think that it was Anissa first? Mm-hmm. You sure? Yeah. Not really. It's sort of confusing because I've been trying to block out the screams all day. So how many times, so then how did you get the knife from Anissa? She sort of just shoved it into my hands and there it was. She goes
goes on to talk about the actual stabbing as if she's just telling her parents about her day at school. And she keeps repeating, when asked why they did this, that it was necessary. But she can't explain why it was necessary, it just was. Morgan said that the man Anissa talks to picked Peyton. And Anissa told her it had to be done. It was necessary. Morgan talks about Slenderman too. She says that she's never met him, but he reads her mind and watches her constantly. He also has tendrils on his back that can extend out as he wishes and are very sharp. Technology doesn't work around him. And once he knows you exist, he'll never leave you. Morgan claimed that she felt as if she was beginning to get the slender sickness due to the slender radiation. The slender sickness can present itself in coughing fits, nosebleeds, coughing up blood, vomiting, paranoia, and it happens as a result of being stalked by Slenderman or having a run-in with him. Apparently, he gives off this radiation that makes you sick. And she thought she was, she was getting the slender sickness. She asks Detective Casey, is it illegal to stab someone in self-defense? And he says, well, you know, it depends, not always, but is that what you think happened here? And she responds simply, no. <laughs> As Detective Casey is scribbling in his notes, she whispers, please don't cut off my head. Please don't cut off my head. Morgan lied during her police interview, right? She said that Anissa had taken part in the stabbing. At this point, neither Anissa or Morgan know that Peyton is alive, so most likely Morgan thought Peyton was dead and there'd be nobody there to dispute that statement besides Anissa. She figured it would be her word against her friends and at least they'd both go down for it. But Peyton, as we already know, miraculously survived and she was able to tell the police officers exactly what happened and who was responsible for stabbing her. It was Morgan. Every single one of the 19 wounds she sustained was given to her by Morgan. And although I'm sure Peyton wasn't a huge fan of Anissa at this point, she didn't implicate her at all in the actual physical stabbing. And this is very calculating, in my opinion, for a 12-year-old, someone in that position, a young girl sitting alone in an interrogation room after killing somebody with blood on her hands, literally might just be compelled to tell the truth because a child's terrified mind may be too frozen to come up with any kind of creative lie. But Morgan, Morgan was able to keep it together enough to understand that she was not gonna go down for this alone. Anissa was gonna come with her. The girls were arrested and jailed to await trial while the detectives investigated and collected more evidence. And they found evidence. Like I said earlier, it seemed like Anissa and Morgan communicated a lot during the day. Even when they were at school, they used their school emails to email each other back and forth. They would email each other stories and links from the creepypasta websites. But some of these exchanges suggested that maybe Morgan actually was seeing things that weren't there. And this wasn't just an attempt on Anissa's behalf to get them an insanity deal. Morgan wrote in one email, I'm hearing someone growing closer and closer to me in a creepy way. I'm hearing footsteps in the hall. I have to go. She also wrote, I just heard someone whisper, you're next. And as the weeks crept closer to the day that they would act out their plan, the girls took certain measures to hide their correspondence. On April 26th, Anissa wrote to Morgan, this is a new email I set up. Now we can talk openly about that thing. P.S. I'm sorry for lying. I was doing it for your sake. I didn't want you to become crazy because you were seeing something and I didn't. Morgan wrote back to Anissa a few minutes later. You didn't tell me anything about lies you had told, but I would estimate that you weren't telling the complete truth when you saw Kate or Slender out the bus window. Rough guess. If I were you, I would copy and paste anything important I sent to your old email and save it as a draft in your new one. Make sure not to leave any traces because once a sad event happens, the school will search your school email. Anissa wrote back to Morgan, well, I lied about some other things, not Kate or Slender, but a few other things, and I did that because I didn't want you to feel insane because you saw something I didn't. Also, I deleted the emails you sent me before I read that. I figured the school would search my email, so I deleted everything. Morgan wrote back to Anissa. It's fair. I lied to help you. If you weren't part of the plan, then your life wouldn't be so exciting. It's fine. I already wrote everything down. Stop feeling like shit. 
It was hurtful when you did because it reminded me of what Bella and Rachel and the other girls who have in the past betrayed me had done. But honestly, I used Vulcan mind tricks so I didn't feel upset at all. Just promise not to fake anything from now on. This involves your stuttering and twitching that you keep up for about a minute every three weeks. Trust me, I can tell the difference. Physical and mental disabilities are no joke. Sorry to be abrupt. Anissa writes back to Morgan. It's okay, I needed a wake-up call, and by the way, I won't lie about anything unless in front of others, and I will not betray you. I have never done that to a friend, let alone someone who I am going to spend the rest of my life with. I swear to God, if you laugh or show any sign of a dirty mind, I will know, but I won't betray you, and I won't twitch unless I get a chill down my spine. The next month, they exchanged more emails alluding to their plan. On May 23rd, the week before the sleepover, Anissa wrote to Morgan, My mom just said because I missed one effing little choir assignment, I might not be able to go. Morgan responded, I swear, if your mom says you can't come, I will literally crawl in your freaking window and add her to that list of bad people. Delete this email. Okay, so I'm just going to say what we're all thinking. I hope we're all thinking it because this completely reminds me of the Pauline Parker and Juliet Hulme case, right? This case feels almost identical to theirs in a lot of ways. I mean, take away the modern ability to write emails and instead add phone calls or written letters or diary entries. The way they speak to each other, the way they became so close that they isolated everyone else. They thought they were receiving messages from some otherworldly being. They felt they were destined for more, that they were better than other people, and that after they committed this murder, there would be nothing stopping them from living happily together in their fantasy world. It's honestly eerie, and if you're new here and you haven't seen the Pauline Parker and Juliet Hume videos, I will link those in the description box, and I'll put a card in here so you can go check them out, but it's crazy. They're so, so similar. Detectives also went through the lockers of Morgan and Anissa. They found some disturbing things in their notebooks. But I would have to say that 95% of the disturbing things were found in Morgan's notebooks. A list titled Supplies Necessary, Pepper Spray for Jeff the Killer, Map of the Forest, Camera, Spray Bottle for Ben, Cheesecake for Maskey and Hoodie, The Will to Live, Weapons, kitchen knife, and flashlights. So this was a list of things they would need on their journey to Nicolette National Park to live in the Slenderman Mansion. The odd things on the list that seem out of place, such as cheesecake, pepper spray, and a spray bottle, these are items that can be used against their corresponding creepy pastas. just so you guys know. A drawing of Slenderman with the words, you are strange child, it will be of my use. Circles with X's drawn through them and the words, he cannot be harmed. A bigger circle with two X's where the eyes would be on a face and the words, he still sees you. There's a cartoon drawn by Morgan which shows a girl who has cat-like features like ears and a tail and she's holding a Sith. At her feet lies another cartoon girl with a skull and crossbones over her head and the words that caption this picture are, I love killing people. They found Barbie dolls in Morgan's room. Some had their arms or legs cut off, others had red marks slashed into them, as if she was practicing on dolls before she did the real murder. I mean, just really disturbing stuff. Anissa's internet and YouTube history also lean toward the creepy and macabre, in my opinion. There was a video she watched where the viewer would answer questions as they passed on the screen, and then at the end, depending on how you answered the questions, it would determine whether or not you were a psychopath. Anissa wrote in the comment section how high her score was, saying, Officer, cuff me, I got the right answers. She watched another video on how to know if you're a sociopath, and on that video, she commented, LOL, 18, yes, they're coming to take me away, ha ha. In another video she watched, you can see a self-defense instructor explaining how to use your car keys to get away from a potential attacker. He tells the viewer to use the keys to strike into any soft tissue on the body. The eyes, the cheeks, into the throat. Which is certainly telling, considering on the day that they tried to murder Peyton, Morgan told Anissa, you know where all the soft spots are. And lastly, a video titled, Feeding My Servile Cat a Live Mouse for the First Time. And in the video, we can see this cat and this mouse in a bathtub together, and the cat just batters the mouse to death with its paws before eating it. And Anissa wrote in the comment section, I love how Zeus beats the mouse to death. 
Police also questioned classmates of Morgan and Anissa's, and for the most part, a lot of their peers didn't really communicate with either girl that much. But one classmate of Anissa's testified at the trial that Anissa often spoke about Slenderman, and one day she told this girl that she figured out how to be a proxy of Slenderman. When the girl asked how, Anissa replied, you have to kill one of your friends. And after a small pause, she said, don't worry, it's not you. How did nobody report these girls before this? How? How? You got Anissa telling a girl, in order to be a proxy, you have to kill one of your friends. Don't worry, it's not you. You got Morgan over here starving her sims to death and then setting their house on fire. How did nobody bring this to anyone's attention before this? This is my question. You just have to kill one of your friends. Don't worry, it's not you. I feel so much better now. Thanks, Anissa. Anissa and Morgan would be tried separately and charged with attempted first-degree homicide as adults, which was a very controversial decision. Under Wisconsin law, anyone aged 10 years or older who is charged with first-degree homicide will be tried as an adult. This fact greatly impacted the sentence the girls would be facing if found guilty. If they were found guilty as juveniles, they would have been incarcerated for up to three years and then placed under supervision until the age of 18. But facing these charges as adults could potentially see them facing up to 65 years in prison. Both Anissa and Morgan pled not guilty due to mental disease or defect, but days before Anissa's trial was scheduled to start, she took a deal offered to her by the prosecution. She pled guilty to the lesser charge of intentional attempted second-degree homicide, but she still had to go to trial to determine whether she would spend her time in a prison or a mental health institution. Anissa's defense team tried to prove that she'd been led along by Morgan. Morgan was the driving force in this friendship. And together, they lived with a shared delusion. The defense painted a picture of a young girl who was struggling. She had attended meetings at school with a group of kids whose parents had also gotten divorced. Her teachers testified that she was struggling and at times seemed very sad. And she didn't really have a lot of friends at school because of her trouble relating to them. But when Anissa's father, Bill, took the stand, he didn't really help the defense's case. He didn't help the case of his own daughter. He got up on the stand and he said he'd never known his daughter to be struggling with depression. He also said that she'd never seen things that weren't there. He said there'd been only one incident when she was about 10, they would put her to bed, and then she screamed for her parents to come in because she saw something. She said she saw a pair of red eyes looking out at her from the closet. They came in, turned on the lights, showed her that there was nothing in her closet, and the rest of the night passed without incident. But he didn't consider it to be a delusion by any means. He just thought it was a young girl who was afraid of the dark. And it never happened again. They also said that her father, Bill's ex-wife, who was the mother of two of his other children, she had recently passed away from cancer and Bill had been distracted trying to help his other children grieve the loss of their mother. And he'd let Anissa kind of slide under the radar. So Anissa had been sad, lonely, and the adults in her life were wrapped up with their own personal stuff. Possibly too distracted to notice exactly what was going on with her. During Morgan's trial, many psychiatrists testified that Morgan had been living with undiagnosed schizophrenia, and also she was diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder. Morgan's father had also been living with schizophrenia, and while Morgan was incarcerated, she saw doctors who testified that she continued to see things, such as Snape from Harry Potter, who would visit her in her cell and prevent her from getting enough sleep. She told her parents and the doctors that being in prison wasn't too bad because of her Vulcan mind control, she could be anywhere she wanted mentally. Morgan told her psychiatrist that she'd been having these visions and delusions as long as she could remember, her earliest one being at the age of three. And Morgan's mother claimed that as she got older and realized that other people were not seeing what she was seeing, she hid it from her parents and teachers so they wouldn't think she was crazy. This does add up with the emails that were being sent between Anissa and Morgan where Anissa apologizes for lying about seeing something that wasn't there, but she says she did it so that Morgan wouldn't feel crazy. 
Finally, in 2017, Anissa, who was now 16, was sentenced to 25 years under the care of the state's mental health department. So the jury felt that she should not be held criminally responsible for her actions because she was mentally ill at the time. Morgan was also sentenced to a mental hospital for 40 years. Peyton's parents were not too happy about the outcome of Morgan and Anissa's trial. They believed that these two girls were dangerous and they should have been treated as if they were dangerous. They had written a letter to the judge who was going to determine the sentences before he made a decision. They wanted it to be remembered who the real victim was, their daughter. There was only one little girl that was stabbed 19 times brutally. In many ways, Peyton is doing very well. She gets great grades in school. She has a lot of friends. She's taking a number of advanced placement classes, and in that regard, she's doing very well. Having said that, the trauma of that horrific premeditated attempted murder will stay with her forever and stay with the family forever. They say your life can change in an instant. For us, that instant was the morning of May 31st, 2014, when our daughter Peyton was brutally stabbed 19 times by two people she trusted, people she believed were her friends. The trauma of that day has defined our lives for the past three and a half years and continues to remind us how one event can change everything you believe to be true. The 19 stab wounds that Peyton endured that day left 19 very visible scars on her arms, her legs, her hip, her torso, and her chest. The nearly six hour surgery and other medical treatments to repair her heart, diaphragm, liver, stomach, and pancreas left six more scars. Two of these scars span from just below her neck to just below her belly button. They are still red and angry more than three years later. They tingle and ache and remind her of their presence every day. Things that should be a fun experience for a mother and daughter have become mired with reminders of her attack. Shopping for homecoming dresses leaves only a few options because far too many dresses will show off her scars. Beach vacations are harsh reminders that swimsuits aren't made for girls with 25 scars. But Peyton's wounds are far beyond physical. The emotional trauma she has endured will remain with her for a very long time. It will fade and feel less intense as the years progress, but it will always be there, menacing in the back of her mind, reminding her not to trust too deeply or love unconditionally because the last time she did, she nearly died. For months after the attack, Peyton would only speak to me. She slept in my bed partially because she needed help getting in and out of bed, but mostly because she was afraid to sleep in her own room. She wouldn't go in the basement because the last time Morgan was at our house, the basement rec room was where they played and slept. When she did finally move back into her bedroom, she refused to unlock the windows or open the curtains. She slept with scissors under her pillow. She couldn't sleep unless I was in the room next to her and I could respond to three knocks on her wall with three knocks on mine, signifying, I love you, you're safe, and I'm here. If I happened to be gone for the evening, she wouldn't go to sleep until I got home. Outwardly, Peyton seemed to recover remarkably fast. She went to sleepovers, made new friends, started seventh grade on time and in the same school she had been in the year before. She went on cross-country trips to Hilton Head and Rhode Island with friends and international trips to Canada with her French class. But she was different. She was more reserved and more cautious. She held everyone at arm's length and never let anyone get too close. Our marriage was drastically affected as well. Everyone copes differently with trauma and loss. We knew that going into this, but we could never seem to get on the same page, which made it harder to come together during times when we really needed each other. What felt like never ending trips to the courthouse for hearings, media requests, and doctor and therapy appointments created a cavern between the two of us. As the years dragged on, the cavern got wider and scarier to breach. And even though we both love each other and cherish our family, we can't seem to find a way to traverse the pain that exists in that cavern and find our way back to one another. Joe and I raised Peyton and her brother Caden to be empathetic and compassionate people. In the end, it was that compassion that led Peyton into the woods with Morgan and Anissa. You see, Peyton knew that if she wasn't Morgan's friend, then Morgan wouldn't have any friends. She felt a need to protect Morgan and believed deeply that every person deserved at least one friend. Peyton is a remarkable human being that survived the unthinkable, but she will struggle with the events of that day and physical and emotional scars it left for the rest of her life. We are all still trying to figure out what it means to live in the new normal that we have been forced to endure. We didn't choose this life. It was thrust upon us unwillingly, and we have had no choice but to stand up and deal with it in the best way we knew how. Peyton has a lifetime of healing ahead of her, 
and she deserves to be allowed to heal in an environment where she feels safe. I know she will not feel safe if either Morgan or Anissa are released back into the community unsupervised. She has big dreams, and my hope is that nothing stands in her way while she strives to achieve them. Thank you for your consideration, Stacey Lutner. In both Anissa and Morgan's trial, the defense team painted a picture that they'd have done it because they were afraid that if they didn't do it, something would happen to their families. But the DA's office didn't buy that for a second, stating in Anissa's own words that she hadn't known about the danger to herself or her family until after the stabbing. She told the detectives at one point she had started crying and told Morgan that she wanted to call her mother and go home. But Morgan had said, if you do that, you'll spend your life in prison, either that or be executed. At that point, Anissa claims that she broke down and told Morgan that it was all her fault, saying, you stabbed her, you wanted to do this. And Morgan, who rarely ever cried, also began sobbing and yelled into the sky, Slender, if you're listening, please help us. But nothing happened. No one answered, no one came to help, and they continued to walk to Slenderman's mansion. And when I first looked into this case, I felt that Anissa had been the ringleader. She'd been the one who was struggling with stuff at home. She'd been the one who was new to the school. She'd been the one who had introduced Morgan to Slenderman. I thought maybe after she connected with Morgan, who was her only friend at that point, she'd become jealous of Peyton and wanted to get her out of the picture. But once researching fully, watching the trial, watching the interviews, reading everything I could get my hands on, my opinion changed. I would like to say that I don't believe Anissa was mentally ill. I think she was a young girl who was going through a lot and latched onto a friend. I think she was probably found to be mentally ill by a jury because nobody felt comfortable sending a 12 year old to prison for the bulk of her life, but that's just my opinion, don't come for me. I do think Morgan was the dominant personality here. You can sense it in the emails and in the statements of those who knew both the girls. Anissa seemed to defer to Morgan quite a bit and do things to impress her and hold on to her friendship. She wanted to make Morgan believe that they were experiencing the same things in order to reinforce their bond. Even Peyton had said that when Morgan was around, Anissa was a different person, a meaner person. However, I do believe that Morgan was mentally ill. I've seen a lot of articles and a lot of things online saying that she faked it, but given her family history and just the way she presents, to me, there's no doubt that she's schizophrenic. Childhood schizophrenia is pretty rare, but when it does happen, it can be severe. The child who is suffering will experience and interpret reality differently, abnormally. I think that Anissa was so lonely and so desperate for a friend that when Morgan began to believe that the Slenderman story was real, Anissa went along with it. Because Morgan was so passionate and so sure and she would tell Anissa that she was seeing things like Slenderman. And even though Anissa didn't see these things, she would lie and tell Morgan that she did, which then reinforced Morgan's belief that Slenderman was real. Morgan may have felt like maybe she wasn't crazy. Maybe she wasn't experiencing or seeing things that weren't real or weren't there. Maybe she just hadn't found the right person yet who could also see these things. Maybe she'd found that person in Anissa. So in a way, yes, they shared a delusion born out of isolation and loneliness, feeling different and feeling left out. I also think there was some growing animosity in Morgan towards Peyton. They had been good friends for many years, but as Morgan spiraled deeper into her disease, and as Peyton had no idea what was happening and only knew that her friend was acting weird, Peyton pulled away. Morgan referenced this in one of her emails, saying that Peyton and some of the other girls had made her feel bad. However, I do not believe that Morgan and Anissa thought that if they didn't stab a Peyton, something bad was gonna happen to their families. I agree with the prosecution that this angle didn't come up until after the act of the stabbing. Most likely, they concocted that story on their long walk together to the mansion. Maybe they felt like they weren't going to make it to Nicolette State Park. Maybe they knew they were going to encounter the police at some point, and they'd have to have a story that gave them a motive. They'd have to have a good reason for why they just killed their friend. I believe their only motive was to prove to the skeptics that Slenderman was real. I do believe that they thought he was real and that they actually thought that they'd find him and live happily ever after with him. 
Because as scary as Slenderman is to most of us, to some young individuals who feel different, who feel left out, he represented a figure who's not accepted by society, who looks and acts differently, but he's also powerful and in control, and they felt connected to him on that level. So they think they could be the ones, the ones who are accepted and chosen by him and brought under his wing. After being violently attacked, Peyton is recovering and flourishing today. I'm always struck when I read about this case, how brave and strong she was. I've also questioned whether I would have even been able to do that myself. She was in so much pain. She could barely breathe. She couldn't see, but she knew she was not going to die in those woods. She knew there was more out there for her, more she still had to do. Currently, as of this year, Morgan Geyser is trying to appeal her conviction. Her lawyers are saying that she should never have been tried as an adult. They're also saying that Morgan's confession should have been inadmissible during the trial. Her attorney, Matthew Pinks, claimed that when she agreed to give a statement, she had no idea what she was agreeing to. And when she agreed to waive her rights, she had no idea what she was agreeing to give up. And yeah, it is a little strange that two 12-year-olds were interviewed by the police without a lawyer or parents present. However, I think if there's any two 12-year-old girls out there who understood what their Miranda rights were and what they were waiving, it would be these two. They were both very smart beyond their years, and I'm not sure the appeal is going to go through, but let me know what you guys think in the comments. Should they have been tried as adults? Did they get off way too easily? Was Morgan the driving force in this, or do you think it was more Anissa? And let's give a round of applause to Peyton Lutner, who was such a badass that she was able to get herself to help when she'd been left for dead. I definitely do struggle with the fact that they were tried as adults, even though I think what they did is absolutely horrendous and horrible. This was a law in Wisconsin that was made a long time ago before a lot of medical research was done to show that children's brains aren't fully evolved and developed enough to understand consequences and actions. But I also don't think that being tried as juveniles and only serving a couple of years would be enough of a punishment for these girls. I guess the moral of the story is parents talk to your kids, especially if you see that your kid is spending a lot of time on the internet or on YouTube, ask them what they're looking into, show an interest, and maybe they'll confide in you and tell you that they're looking up something like Slenderman or watching videos where a YouTuber FaceTimes Jesus. And then you have that opportunity to use it as a learning moment and tell your child what you see on the internet looks cool. It's like watching TV, it's entertainment. It's there for entertainment but it's not real and let them know the reasons why it can't be real and maybe direct their interest to something a little bit more uh, productive and less terrifying. Obviously the guy who created Slenderman and the creepypasta forums and all of this, they came out and they're like, we had nothing to do with this, you know, definitely didn't expect this to happen. But I have to ask you like, what did you expect to happen? I know it's cool to tell spooky stories and convince people that they're real. And like I said, some of us may find that entertaining and fun. However, you have to keep in mind as a responsible human being who lives on this earth, that when you're putting something on the internet, it's accessible to everyone, people of all ages, people who may not be completely mentally healthy and who may take these stories that you're convincing them are real and turning them into something that is actually real. But once again, let me know what you guys think in the comments. I know this was a long one. I know it was probably really upsetting. Tell me what you think about this whole thing. How eerily similar is it to Pauline Parker and Juliet Hume? I also have some Patreon October birthday shout outs. Salwa Sidamed, probably said that wrong, but their birthday is on October 15th. And that's also the same day as my oldest daughter, Nev's birthday. She's going to be 18 on the 15th. So happy birthday. Sharon Iyer's birthday is on the 14th. Paige Larson's birthday is on the 17th. Courtney Waters' birthday is on the 19th. And B539 has a birthday on October 17th. Mary-Kate Bashline had her birthday on October 3rd. 
And one of my Patreons, Brie, her daughter's turning three on October 16th. And Brie says that she and her daughter love to cuddle and watch my videos. So happy birthday. Bella's going to be three in January. So I know how much of a fun and cuddly time this age can be. I will shout the rest of my Patreons October birthdays out in the next video. Happy birthday to all of you. Happy birthday to you guys out there. If you're not a Patreon, it's just your birthday in October. October holds a special place in my heart. Obviously, my first child was born in October. October's Halloween. October's the best month out of all 12 months. So I love you guys so much. Thank you to my Patreons as always for supporting me. I could not do this without you guys. Have a wonderful day. Stay kind, stay beautiful, and stay spooky, and I'll see you next time. Bye!